If you need freedom, a savior, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. We are in week three of our Beauty and the Beast series. And, uh, and so we talked about, we, we kind of based everything on this idea of conflict. And we said that, uh, that conflict is when you break your microphone stand. No. Conflict is, uh, is the good guy versus the bad guy. It's what uh, every good story that you read or every good movie that you watch has that moves the plot along. And every story has conflict in it, even the cartoons that my kids watch. Uh, Knox and Helen love to watch Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. And, and now you might think, well, what, why does the Disney Junior TV show have conflict in it? It's because a show without conflict is incredibly boring. And so even Mickey Mouse Clubhouse is going to have a little bit of conflict in that. So who, who would be the good guy or good guys in Mickey Mouse Clubhouse? Mickey and the gang. Mickey and the gang. Who is the bad guy in Mickey Mouse Clubhouse? Pete. What kind of animal is Pete, by the way? I think he's a cat. It's the weirdest looking cat I've ever seen. So you have Mickey, Mickey Mouse and the gang are the good guys. And you have Pete the cat. Pete the awkward cat as the bad guy. And, and, and so every episode, not every episode, but a lot of episodes, you have Pete try to take something from them or try to keep them from accomplishing some kind of goal. And uh, Mickey and the gang try to defeat him, but they always defeat him very kindly and include him at the end. Mickey handles his conflict a lot differently than, say, like the Avengers would handle conflict when they try to <laughs> defeat their enemies, kill their enemies, that kind of thing. But, uh, but conflict, we said, originally comes from Scripture. Conflict comes from Scripture. The original con conflict is between Satan and, and, and God. Satan and Jesus. You have Satan, the bad guy, who with his pride fell from heaven and he's trying to infect us uh, with, uh, with his sin. And you have Jesus, the good guy who comes in and, and saves us and literally saves the day, saves our lives as the good guy. In Beauty and the Beast, we said the bad guy was Gaston. Gaston was a very prideful man. He, uh, his fatal flaw was the same fatal flaw of every bad guy that's out there. It's pride. He thought that whatever he wanted was his. Even if it wasn't his, even if he didn't own it, he thought that it, whatever, he had, whatever he wanted was his because he was Gaston because he was the biggest and strongest. And so if he wanted food, he would take it. If he wanted a house, he would take it. And if he wanted a girl, he would take her. And what he wanted was Belle. And, and so he thought that, that she should just fall into his arms simply because he, Gaston, the biggest man in town, wanted to, uh, wanted to marry her. He thought that she should be grateful because it was Gaston who was asking her to marry, her, marry him. And, and, and she didn't. She hated it. And so he, he was just beside himself. He was disgusted. And, and, uh, and so what happens uh, is that somebody's watching and they just get disgusted with Gaston. They think, what a pig this guy is. What a jerk. I can't believe anybody would be interested in a guy like that. I can't believe someone would actually act like that. But, you know, pride is something that we struggle with all the time. And sometimes, sometimes pride uh, among you or among your, your peers, your classmates, might show up looking a lot like Gaston's pride. Guys, you have probably heard a friend of yours badmouth a girl because she turned him down. You know, you know that there's a guy who has gone and, and asked a girl out or asked a girl uh, to, uh, to, to hang out with him or whatever, and she turns him down. So they come back to you and to your friends. They call her all kinds of names. It's all of a sudden, it's her fault that she turned him down. Just like Gaston thinks it's Belle's fault that she's turning him down. They, the pride doesn't force us to look at our own lives for, for flaws. It makes us look for flaws in everybody else. But girls struggle with pride, too. Girls, it is pride that causes you to just completely ignore a, a former friend of yours for years because you heard a rumor that she said something about you one time a long time ago. That happens with girls. There, there's, there's adults, adult females who have, who have uh, former friendships, former friends that they won't, even, they won't even follow them on social media because of that one time they said something to them back in middle school. You can ask your moms about that. That happens. That's a pride issue. Pride was Gaston's fatal flaw. Pride was Satan's fatal flaw. Pride shows up in you, and if it's left unchecked, it can become your fatal flaw 
as well. But whenever there's a bad guy, there's also a good guy. Belle, we talked about last week, Belle was our hero. She was the savior. She came in and saved the day. She took her dad's place as a prisoner in the beast's castle. And, and, and the love that she grew, the, the, the love that she had, the love that she found for the beast caused a massive change in his life. And it caused a massive change in the lives around him. And so we said Belle was like Jesus, but she's different than Jesus because Jesus doesn't have any flaws. We said that Belle would, uh, would, would kind of pass over people that were in need around her. And, and Belle uh, was afraid of the beast. And Belle didn't love him until he earned her love. That's different from Jesus, though, because, see, Jesus wants us to bring every possible need that we have. He notices us, even the littlest things that we struggle with, he notices us. Jesus fearlessly loves us. He's not afraid of our deepest secrets. He's not afraid of our, the darkest parts of our heart. He wants us to bring those to him. He wants, he wants to come into those dark places, and he loves us unconditionally. He doesn't need us to dress up and to look fancy and to act right for him to love us. That's Jesus. And so we said Bell maybe more closely resembles the church. The church, that's the, the international uh, church. Everybody who has ever been a Christian is called the church. We call it the Big C Church, the Capital C Church. And so we said that Bell resembles us because we have those same flaws. We get too caught up in our own lives. And we miss out on people that are in need around us. We're afraid of people who are different from us. And we make people clean up before we love them. Bell is a lot like the church. But the church is called to be like Jesus. You notice though, when, when Jesus loves someone, when somebody encounters the love of Jesus, it changes them. And so as Christians, as the church, we're supposed to show the love of Jesus to people because you can't have an encounter with Jesus and not be radically changed. You can't have an encounter with the love of Christ and not be changed because love changes people. Love changes people. I remember Julie and I got married when we were uh, 28 going on 29. We got married late uh, in our 20s, and, and we were some of the last uh, single people in our friend group. And there were guys that I was friends with that I, would, uh, I could call up when, when we were all single and be late at night and say, hey, let's go get coffee, uh, let's go to this party, let's go to this event, let's go to this restaurant, whatever, let's go to this movie late at night, and they could just get up and go. But all of a sudden, they started getting married, and then it wasn't so easy to hang out with them anymore. I would call them up, and, and I'd say, hey, it's, uh, it's 10 o'clock, let's go get some food. And they'd act like I just woke them up. And I'm like, what are you doing in bed already? And they're like, well, we fell asleep on the couch watching House Hunters and drinking hot chocolate. And I'm like, what a horrible night. He's like, man, it was the best. Because <laughs> love changes people. Love changes people. There's a time when I was upset about that. There's a time when I was upset about that. But, you know, love, and I think, man, they're so boring now. But really what happens is that love, the love of their wife, the love that they had for their wife, made them give up some things that weren't as important so that they could love their wife even more. And they were perfectly content in that. That's incredible. That's an incredible thing. Love changes people. And the love that Bell had changed the beast. Because every time that you have conflict in a story, there's got to be somebody to be saved. There's got to be somebody that needs to be changed. Maybe in, maybe in a movie there's, there's a person that the bad guy and the good guy are fighting over. Maybe there's, a, there's a, a small town in an old western movie that the gang is trying to take from the, the sheriff. Maybe there's a nation of people that's at stake in this war between two countries. There's always got to be somebody that has to be saved. And there's got to be somebody who, who needs to be impacted by, uh, by the victory or by the loss. There's got to be someone who will hurt if the bad guy wins and somebody who will heal if the good guy wins. There's always somebody that's stuck in the middle. And in this movie, in Beauty and the Beast, that's the beast. That's the beast. You see, we have the, this guy, this beast. He wasn't always a beast. He used to be Prince Adam. We saw at the beginning that what happened was he was this prince who was very full of himself. He also suffered from the sin of pride like Gaston had. And so you have this Prince Adam who, who, was, who was wealthy. He had everything that he could possibly want. He was very confident in himself. He put his, his, uh, his, his faith in his castle to keep him safe. He put his faith in his looks and his personality to get him what he wanted. 
and, and he didn't want to mess with anybody that he thought was ugly. He didn't have time for people who were in need. He wanted he, the only relationships he wanted were with people who could give him something, who could offer him something. And here comes this little old lady. She comes along. It's a stormy night, and she says, "Can I? I, I just need a place to stay for one night, and I'll give you this rose." And he's like. I don't need your rose. I've got thousands of rose, rose bushes here, and I've got butlers galore who will cut those for me. I don't need you. Plus, you kind of turn me off. That wart on your nose is turning me off a little bit. You got some halitosis. You got some bad breath. And you got some jacked up teeth. I don't want to spend time with you in my castle. You imagine my reputation, the damage my reputation would take if I let you in my castle and people saw. What are my staff going to think if they, if they see that you're here? What are they going to tell people in town? I can't have you in here. You're a pox on this community. I need you to get out of here. And so this lady, and I cut out part of the introduction. What happens then is when he turns her away, this, this, old, uh, this old nasty looking lady turns into this beautiful princess. She turns into this beautiful princess and Prince Adam was like, I have made a huge mistake. And, and so he starts begging and begging for forgiveness and growling at her feet. I'm so sorry. I can't believe I did that. And she's like, beauty is what's on the inside, punk. Now you're going to get what you deserve. And so she cursed him. She turned him into this beast. And she said, you're going to remain this way until somebody falls in love with you as you are. Until somebody falls in love with you as the beast. And, and, and that, that will change you. But there's a limited amount of time for this. If this rose dies before somebody falls in love with you, then you're going to remain a beast forever. I mean, it seems kind of like a harsh punishment that she would curse him just for... Sending her out in the rain. Well, that helps move the story along, I guess. But here's the story. You have somebody who messed up, who was cursed, and needs someone's unconditional love to save him. Does that sound familiar? That's the story of Scripture. If you've, if you've already trusted Christ as your Savior, if you're in here today and, and you have put your trust in Christ as your Savior, the beast is you before them, B.C., before Christ. When you hear somebody give a testimony, they might talk about B.C., their life before Christ. The beast is you before Christ. You used to live under a curse, but you've been set free. If you're in here and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, though, the beast is where you are. You're living under a curse. Living under a curse, there's no way out of it. Save for the love of Jesus Christ. Tonight we're going to get into this idea of this curse of sin. What it does to us. And what unconditional love can do to set us free from that. So if you've got your Bibles with you tonight, turn to Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17. If you've got a hard copy Bible, it's in the Old Testament. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Then what? Isaiah. Isaiah. Jeremiah. Jeremiah, that's right. If you got your iPhone Bible or your phone Bible, it's about a third of the way down the list of books. Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah was a prophet to Judah. And God had raised up Jeremiah as a prophet. And he said, listen, Jeremiah, uh, Judah's uh, been really bad. And they're about to get what they deserve. But these other nations are going to come in and destroy Judah. And I need you to tell them about it. I need you to tell them why it's going to happen. And so, so Jeremiah's job is to go around Judah saying, uh, y'all were in trouble and uh, it's your fault uh, because you've sinned uh, so you better repent now uh, just get yourself right with God because uh, things are about to get rough here so that was Jeremiah's job so let's see what he has to say Jeremiah chapter 17 verses 5 and 6 thus says the Lord this is Jeremiah quoting God thus says the Lord cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. It's kind of painting a bleak picture, but here's the situation. Judah had the same problem that the beast had. The prince, uh, the beast as the prince, trusted in himself. He put his trust in, in, in the, his strength he put his trust in his castle. He put his trust in his possession, his looks, his personality. That's where he put his trust. He said, I have all that I ever will need, and I can get anything that I will ever want right here within myself. 
putting my complete trust in me. Judah had this same issue. But when, when, when the beast was cursed, when the beast was cursed, he, ended up, he, he, he wasn't so sure of himself anymore. He realized, he realized where he had put his faith was temporary. What he had put his faith in, what he was relying on for strength, it was all temporary. It was going to be gone. It could be taken away from him in the blink of an eye. And so what happened instead of, as the beast, instead of going out in the community and trying to make friends or whatever, he recognized where he was and he just stayed, in, stayed inside. He refused to go out. He became very depressed and kind of resigned himself, surrendered himself to this idea that he was going to be cursed forever. He gave up on the, any, on the idea that anybody could love him. Now imagine yourself as part of Judah in this scenario here that Jeremiah is laying out. Jeremiah says, listen, Judah, you've messed up. You've relied on your armies. You've relied on your cities. You've relied on, on the walls around your cities for strength. You put your strength, you put your trust in the wrong place. You put your trust in mankind. You have not put your trust in me. And so he says, you know what? You're going to be like a shrub in the desert. You're going to be like a shrub in the desert. Interesting thing about this, though. A shrub in the desert it, it implies that, there's, that there is some growth happening. There's something happening. A shrub in the desert is still alive. A cactus is alive, even though it's in the desert. And it's lonely. It's dry. And it's hot. The, the cactus is still alive. And so Jeremiah is recognizing that, hey, yeah, you're going to be, a, you're going to be a, a shrub in the desert. There's still going to be some growth. You're still going to grow uh, stronger. You're still, you might grow taller. But you're not going to fulfill what you were created to fulfill. You're not going to fulfill who you were created to be because you're going to be alone. You're going to be without any help. That's the thing. People will always tell somebody who's not a Christian, like, you know, your life must be terrible. And most of the time they'll say, no, you know what, my life is pretty good. Got lots of money, got lots of stuff, got lots of friends. Life is okay. A lot of times somebody who's not a Christian will say that and they'll wonder why in the world, why in the world would I ever need Christ? If I've got everything that I want. And you see it right here in this verse. Yeah, you're growing. You're growing, but you're not fulfilling everything that God said you could fulfill. You're, you're missing out on so much joy. You're missing out on this incredible life that God has promised you. It says, it says, shall not see any good come. You shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Life is pretty lonely. A life living under the curse of sin is pretty lonely. You might not want to admit it. Maybe you think, well, I've got everything I want. Things are pretty cool right now. I'm pretty good. You're missing out on all the stuff that God has promised you. God promises you, uh, God promises you love and relationship, love, love through relationships. God has written that onto our hearts. He says, you know what, I'm going, to have, I'm going to make you desire a relationship with other people. And so God promises this, uh, this to us. He gives us a structure for how this should work out with marriage. But instead of relying on God's structure, maybe you look for that satisfaction. You look for that relationship. You look for that satisfaction in something else. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's pornography. Maybe it's a hookup, a one-night stand, that kind of thing. For a moment, for a moment, you feel that happiness. Maybe you feel that connection. But then it's gone then it's gone because it wasn't real. It was a cheap imitation of what God has promised you. Yeah, you had some fun that night, but it didn't last. you got to go again and again and again. It's the same thing that happens when you say, you know, I'm going to get my, my happiness, my fulfillment from, from like drugs or alcohol. There's a high involved. There's a high involved in that. And for a moment, you feel happy. But then it goes away. It doesn't last. Because it's a cheap imitation. The joy that God promises you. But instead of living that, instead of desiring and pursuing that joy, you keep going back to the same well over and over and over again. And it leaves you emptier and emptier and emptier every single time. And that's the thing. When, when you're pursuing this life under the curse... There's going to be times when you experience something that you think, this is great, this is fantastic, but it always goes away. It 
always goes away. When you find that fulfillment in Christ, when you give your life over to Him, that feeling doesn't go away, that fulfillment doesn't go away, that joy doesn't go away. It's an incredible thing. So you have the beast who's living under the curse. You have this beast who's living under the curse. And, and, and he's given up hope. He says, there's, no, there's nothing that's going to change about me. I'm destined to live under the curse forever. But then along comes Bell. Bell, who shows up in the prison, or shows up in the castle, he throws her into prison. And the people in the castle, the other kind of characters in the castle, realize, hey, this is going to be our last chance. This is going to be our time to get somebody to fall in love with our boss, with the beast. And so they convince the beast to put on this show. So they put on a tuxedo. Go dancing in the great hall. Make her a great, we'll make her a great dinner. Uh, you can show her the library. She loves books. We're going to do everything we can. You're going to put your best foot forward and you're going to convince this girl that you're worthy of love. It turns out, I don't want to give too much away, but you can probably guess what happens. I've referenced it multiple times. She ends up falling in love with him. She ends up falling in love with him. He changes. He becomes human again. It's a fantastic thing. The curse is lifted. That's the cool thing about, about the Bible, though. The Bible doesn't ask us to put on a show to get God to love us. He doesn't ask us to change anything to, get, to receive his love. Even if you're living under the curse, even if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, the cool thing about it is that he loves you. John 3.16. John 3.16 is a verse that everybody uh, has, has heard at one point or another. Maybe most of you haven't memorized. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved what? The world. The world. Who's part of the world? Everybody. everybody. Everybody is. It doesn't say that God so loved the Christians. It doesn't say God so loved the white people. It doesn't say that God so loved the, the well-dressed. It doesn't say God so loved the hymn singers or the praise chorus singers. It doesn't say that God so loved anybody specific. It says that God loves everybody. God loves the entire world. God loves the entire world. And so he sent his son Jesus so he sent his son, Jesus. The thing is, we're living under this curse of sin. We, we, we are sinners. And, and because of our sin, we can't be in this relationship with God. God is holy. God is perfect. God is separate. He's set apart. And so because of his holiness, because of his perfection, our sin cannot be in his presence. And so we're separated from him for eternity. But the thing is, God doesn't want us to be separate from him for eternity. He wants to be in a relationship with us. He created us. It says in the Bible that, he, that you were fearfully and wonderfully made. Like he crafted you together. He knit you together in your mother's womb. He says that he made you perfectly. He made you exactly as he wanted to make you. He loves you that much. And somebody who loves you that much isn't going to be satisfied not having a relationship with you. And so even though you sin, God still wants to have a relationship with you. Romans 5 eight says that God demonstrates his own love towards us is that in that while we were sinners, while we were still under the curse of sin, while we were still walking away from him, he sent his son to die for us. So he sent his son. His son took on the curse. His son took on the curse and died for us. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. The curse of sin is death. The curse that we, are, that we are given because we are sinners is that we are eternally separated from Him. That's eternal death. So, God couldn't bear to, keep away, to stay away from us for eternity, so He made His own Son take on that punishment. He made His own Son lift the curse from us and put it on His own shoulders. Because of that, because of that sacrifice, because the good cowboy in the white hat came to town and saved the day, we don't have to live under the curse anymore. We don't have to live under that curse anymore. We don't have to stay where we are. We can, we can walk away from that. 
We can walk out of the darkness of the castle and into the light of God. And what an incredible thing. There's two people in here who need to hear this tonight. The first person is the Christian, someone who's already trusted Christ as their Savior. You need to hear this message over and over and over again. You need to hear the gospel over and over and over again. Because sometimes it, it, it might creep into our heads that we have done something to earn our salvation. It might creep into our heads that, 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 that we deserve our salvation. That we're so good and we're so clean cut. And we say such nice things to people that God can't help but love us and he just wants us to be in heaven because we're so good. And everybody else is bad and they don't deserve heaven. You need to hear the gospel over and over and over again to remind yourself that were it not for Jesus Christ, you would still be under the curse. When you recognize that, when Christian, when you understand that it has nothing to do with you and it has nothing to do with what you do to impress Jesus, you know what it does? It, it makes you see Him differently. It does two things. It makes you see Him differently, see that, that He deserves more than what you're giving Him. And it makes you see other people differently. It makes you see that there are people out there who need to know who Jesus is. It doesn't matter if they're wild and crazy, if, if they have bad reputations, they need to know that Jesus loves them and can set them free from the curse. It, doesn't, it, it makes you realize they don't have to clean themselves up to come to Jesus. The other person that needs to hear this, this, path, this message tonight is the one who is not a Christian, the one who has never trusted Christ as their Savior. Maybe you've heard this over and over and over again. Maybe, maybe, maybe this is the first time you're hearing it and it's kind of hitting you in a weird way. But here's the, here's the bottom line. Because of your sin, because of your sin, you've been cursed. Just like the beast was. The curse of death is on you. But God doesn't want it to stay that way. He, he sent His Son to die on the cross to lift that curse from you. And all you have to do, all you have to do to set yourself free from the curse is put your trust in Jesus Christ. That's it. You don't have to earn His salvation like the beast did. You don't have to earn His love. He loves you regardless. I'm going to ask the band to come forward and close us out tonight. I want to give you guys a time to respond to this. Um, I don't know. I don't know where you're at. I don't know which camp you fall in. I know that that there are some tonight who are Christians, and and you need to respond by just confessing to God that you have tried to earn His love. And you can confess to Him that 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 you need to give more of yourself to Him because He gave everything to you. And there, there's some people in here who need to respond by trusting Christ as their Savior or not. You need to get up and move. I'm going to give you a couple ways to do that during the song tonight. If, if you just want to sit in your seat and pray and talk to God about that, that's fine. If you want to stand up while everybody's standing up around you so that you don't look funny and, and you need to talk to God that way, you can do that too. If you want to move, if you want to come forward and, and pray around here and talk to God like that, you can do that just like we do on Sunday mornings. You can come up here to the front anywhere on the stage and pray to God. But if you want to talk to somebody, if you want to have a conversation with somebody, we've got adults all around the room. I want to be off to the side over here. Adults are all over the place. We want to talk to you. Make tonight the night you put your trust in Jesus as your Savior. Make tonight the night that you lift the curse of sin and death from your life. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we, we're so unworthy. We're so unworthy of your love, God. But you sent your Son to die for us, to take that curse because you loved us. God, what can we do to repay you? We can't do anything but offer our lives to you, God. So God, take us as we are. Rewards and all. God, let us experience your unconditional and, and constant and life-changing love. In Jesus' name I pray.